Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. During the late 18th and early 19th century, the science of paleontology was a fundamentally European project. As covered in the previous video in this series, the earliest modern descriptions of pterosaurs, ichthyosaurs and dinosaurs took place in Germany and Britain respectively, with a variety of often highly imaginative and mythologically inspired paleo art emerging shortly afterwards. Artists were placed in the unenviable position of depicting a menagerie of bizarre extinct reptiles, known mostly from fragmentary remains, so as a result tended to depict these animals as dragon-like monsters or oversized versions of modern lizards. The three genera used as foundational members of the clade Dinosauria, Megalosaurus, Iguanodon and Hyliosaurus, were represented by isolated teeth, jaw bones and partial postcranial material. Analysis by Sir Richard Owen, the leading anatomist of the Victorian era, led to a bulky and almost mammalian version of dinosaur life appearance taking hold during the 1850s. This interpretation was famously put on display to the general public at the Crystal Palace exhibition, with this being an early and highly detailed attempt at scientific outreach. Owen worked alongside sculptor and natural history artist Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins, who crafted the models to the anatomist's specifications and would go on to have a notable career in the United States as well, but more on that later. Audiences were wowed by the prehistoric monsters at Crystal Palace, but somewhat surprisingly, scientific opinion tended to be significantly more negative. The criticisms were many, focusing on their speculative elements, the juxtaposition of modern landscapes with extinct animals, and accusations that they were simply scaled up, monsterized versions of living species. Discoveries in the decades following would reveal Owen's vision of dinosaurs to be inaccurate, such that these flagships of Victorian paleo art were now misleading or confusing the public more than educating them. The Crystal Palace dinosaurs had given scholars of the 1870s reasons to be sceptical of paleo art, and the creation of new life reconstructions fell out of fashion, in Europe at least, for almost a generation. In the United States, however, New discoveries were being made that helped to undermine early 19th century representations of prehistoric reptiles. Although isolated teeth and fragments of fossil material had been known since early colonial times, the first American dinosaurs to be scientifically described came to light during the 1860s. The most important of these was arguably the genus Hadrosaurus, the holotype of which was uncovered in Haddonfield, New Jersey, by polymath William Parker Falk in 1858. Falk contacted Joseph Leedy, the leading American authority on paleontology at the time, and the two men officially described the relatively complete remains of the basal hadrosaurid. These consisted of caudal vertebrae, a partial pelvis, and, most significantly, a near-complete forelimb and hindlimb. Leedy realised that hadrosaurus was quite closely related to the British iguanodon, and suggested that both were capable of bipedal locomotion, being far more slender than Owen's robust, bulky-bodied interpretation. Meanwhile, Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins had travelled to the United States to deliver a series of lectures. On this trip, he met with Lady, and in September 1868, Hawkins agreed to construct a mounted hadrosaurus skeleton for placement in the Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences. The result forever changed the way dinosaurs were displayed in museums around the world. Up to that time, dinosaur bones, if they were exhibited at all, were usually shown as isolated paleontological specimens, without context or meaning to any but a very few specialists. With Lady's guidance, Hawkins took a new approach to the ancient bones. He carefully suspended plaster casts, bone by bone, from a metal armature, filling in the missing bones with plaster reconstructions and topping his model with an invented skull, based loosely on the skull of a modern-day iguana. In a little more than two months of feverish activity, he created the first fully articulated dinosaur skeleton on display anywhere in the world, which he presented as a gift to the Academy in thanks for the institution's generosity in allowing him access to their collections. The skeleton in question was mounted in a bipedal kangaroo-like posture, with the tail resting on the ground and acting as a third limb. To achieve this, Hawkins had to deliberately break the caudal vertebrae, as the living Hadrosaurus possessed a relatively straight tail that acted to counterbalance the front end of the animal, and was held well above the ground. 
In addition, Hawkins' Hadrosaurus was a remarkably lithe and slender beast that contrasted sharply with the Iguanodon sculptures he had produced at Crystal Palace just over a decade prior. Hawkins' Hadrosaurus skeleton was put on exhibition in the Academy's museum in November 1868. The public's response would be overwhelming. Even though the museum was open to the public only two afternoons a week, and closed for the month of August, nearly 100,000 people came to see the Hadrosaurus specimen in 1869, almost twice as many as had visited the museum in the previous year. In creating this specimen, the English sculptor had brought the first wave of dinomania to the United States. The fanfare generated by Hadrosaurus would lead to Hawkins receiving a commission to create a grand Paleozoic Museum in New York City. Intended to be a magnificent building crafted of wrought iron and glass located in Central Park, surviving sketches reveal that the museum would have housed large models comparable to those of Crystal Palace, only updated to reflect the scientific understanding of the time and focusing on American paleontological discoveries. Hawkins was given a studio in the city in order to create sculptures for the museum, which, from surviving drawings, consisted of a reclining, dark-coloured Hadrosaurus and an extinct species of deer. Despite the tremendous success of his display in Philadelphia, Hawkins's New York venture did not fare so well. Corrupt politicians in Tammany Hall, led by the infamous William Boss Tweed, suspended Hawkins' contract in the middle of his work on the lucrative museum project. When Hawkins complained publicly of their interference, their retribution would be shockingly swift and brutal. On the 3rd of May 1871, a gang of thugs, hired by one of Tweed's henchmen, broke into Hawkins' studio and completely destroyed the models, moulds, and completed sculptures that Hawkins had been preparing for over three years. Five months later, Tweed and his gang were arrested, to be tried and convicted for their egregious corruption. But for Hawkins, this justice came too late. The great Paleozoic Museum he had been hired to imagine and create would never recover. Heartbroken by his loss, Hawkins moved on to other projects, augmenting his artistic commissions with a busy schedule of public lectures on life in the prehistoric world. In 1875, after completing a long American lecture tour, Hawkins was invited to create mural-sized oil paintings of ancient life for the Elizabeth Marsh Museum of Geology and Archaeology at the College of New Jersey, now Princeton University. He fashioned a panorama made of up to 17 canvases, each representing a different phase of prehistoric and geological time. The most dramatic and arresting of Hawkins' paintings are of the creatures he knew best from the Cretaceous and Jurassic periods. One of these, The Cretaceous Life of New Jersey, appears to be an expanded version of the scene he had proposed creating in three dimensions for New York's ill-fated Paleozoic Museum. It shows a group of three predatory tyrannosauroids of the genus Lalaps, now known as Dryptosaurus, attacking a retreating herd of Hadrosaurus. This theropod also had been described in the 1860s and had radically changed how these animals would come to be depicted. Like Hadrosaurus, the remains of Lalaps, a relatively early find in the long and infamous career of Edward Drinker Cope, were significantly more complete than those of the European Megalosaurus, and demonstrated that theropods stood bipedally and possessed comparatively short front limbs. This was in stark contrast to the robust, quadrupedal, bear-like Megalosaurus sculpture Hawkins had created for Crystal Palace. Both the Hadrosaurus and Lalaps seem bizarre to a modern viewer, with their incredibly upright postures and skinny bodies making the dinosaurs take on an almost anthropomorphic look, like people wearing skin-tight costumes. In the painting's foreground, two mosasaurs and four elasmosaurs watch the conflict from the relative safety of the sea. Another of Hawkins' paintings, The Jurassic Life of Europe, seems to pay homage to his earlier work for Crystal Palace. Here, a frightened herd of Iguanodon are shown retreating from a snarling, barely bipedal Megalosaurus who has just slain one of their number. Groups of other extinct reptiles, including Cryptosaurus and the crocodilian Pelagosaurus, peer up admiringly at the dominant carnivore, as if learning a lesson about fitness and survival. This composition may have been inspired by the lecture halls in which the Englishman spent much of his time in the US with himself as the authority of Megalosaurus, and his students in the form of the admiring smaller reptiles. 
By the time Hawkins made this painting, most paleontologists had rejected Owen's physical description of Iguanodon and concluded that it was more likely to have been bipedal than quadrupedal. Yet Hawkins painted the species much as he had sculpted it in his 1854 installation in Sydenham. Clearly, the artist did not want to invalidate his own work, as well as the vision of his old mentor Richard Owen. Hawkins retired to England not long afterwards, with his now outdated dinosaur sculptures mocked by the scientific establishment. He died in 1894, with his name and legacy being largely forgotten, overtaken by a new generation of rather more controversial figures within the paleo art world. One of these men was Edward Drinker Cope, zoologist, paleontologist, and the son of a wealthy Pennsylvania Quaker family. A former child prodigy with little in the way of formal education in the field of paleontology, Cope unofficially studied under Joseph Lady at the University of Pennsylvania and received a job cataloguing specimens for his teacher's collections. With a quick temper and a disdain for his father's farming background, Cope avoided the draft for the American Civil War by travelling to Europe, meeting famous scientists and thinkers as he went. In 1863, he met and befriended another paleontology enthusiast, Othniel Marsh, who was studying at the University of Berlin. Marsh possessed two degrees in comparison to Cope's lack of formal education past the age of 16, while Cope had published a far greater number of scientific papers. The two men would remain in contact when the latter returned to the US, exchanging manuscripts, fossils and photographs. In the 1860s, Cope formally described the remains of a tyrannosauroid theropod from New Jersey, which he would name Lalaps in 1866, meaning storm wind in ancient Greek. The relative completeness of the holotype allowed for a far more accurate image of theropod body plans, demonstrating that these animals were bipeds and possessed more slender builds than had previously been thought. Two years later, Cope would also formally describe the large plesiosaur Elasmosaurus, based on remains recovered from Kansas, which was shipped to him via railroad. In a now rather infamous error, he restored this animal with the skull at the tip of the tail, not realising that Elasmosaurus possessed an incredibly elongated neck. In 1869, desiring to create a visual record of his finds, Cope produced his own piece of detailed paleo art, showing the coastal landscape of ancient North America. In the image, a kangaroo-like laylapse stands between two very sea serpent-like elasmosaurs on a flooded beach. Cope's mistaken placement of the skull is evident, with the tails of the plesiosaurs looking remarkably elongated to those familiar with modern depictions of the genus. In the background, we can see a tropical shoreline where a lizard-like hadrosaurus browses from a tree, while indeterminate reptiles lounge nearby. The laylapse in this image is among the earliest examples of a bipedal tail-dragging theropod in art a trope that would last for a century in scientific circles and even longer in popular culture. However, Cope's depiction of Elasmosaurus would lead to the first public spat with his former friend Othniel Marsh. When Lady pointed out Cope's error and suggested that Elasmosaurus actually possessed a greatly elongated neck, the hot-tempered man attempted to hide his mistake by recalling all pre-print copies of his paper. However, Marsh managed to get his hands on one of these and mocked Cope relentlessly, continuing these jibes for decades. This would be the beginning of the intense rivalry between the two, when the men journeyed to the Western American frontier region in search of additional fossils and personal glory. From 1877 to 1892, Marsh and Cope began their dinosaur collecting competition out west. Both used underhanded tactics to disrupt the other, and a full examination of their dirty deeds deserves a full video in its own right. Regardless, the Bone Wars led to the description and naming of a vast array of new dinosaurs, in many instances known from semi-complete material. Iconic animals such as Allosaurus, Stegosaurus, Brontosaurus and Triceratops were formally described at this time, with whole wagon trains and mule caravans full of fossils being sent to museums in the northeast. Despite the enormity and importance of these new finds, however, very little paleo art depicting these animals was created during the period of the Bone Wars. Although it may seem surprising for us today, with images of dinosaurs present everywhere, from books to toys and on our screens, but during the late 19th century, the Thunder Lizards remained something of an academic curiosity. 
artwork designed to educate and inform the public about prehistoric life, such as that made for the Crystal Palace exhibition in London, was simply not considered important in Gilded Age America. Hawkins's panoramic paintings could only be seen by those attending the College of New Jersey, for example. The very elitist nature of Marsh and Cope's worldviews contributed to this, with the incredibly wealthy and supposedly high-class gentleman Cope and the stuffy academic Marsh holding paleoart in low regard. Dinosaurs were for well-to-do and upper-crust scientists, not for the general public. Despite naming and describing some of the most impressive animals to ever walk the earth, including enormous sauropods like Apatosaurus, it is telling that, outside of skeletal reconstructions produced for his papers, Marsh never created fleshy reconstructions of his dinosaurs during the period of the Bone Wars. Citing the inaccuracy of the Crystal Palace sculptures, Marsh was even recorded as saying, Where the skeleton is only partially known, the danger of error is of course much greater, but I would think it very unwise to attempt restoration, as error in a case of this kind is very difficult to eradicate from the public mind. A few years hence, we shall certainly have the material for some good reconstructions of our wonderful extinct animals, but the time is not yet. Due to this attitude, attempts to reconstruct creatures in the flesh fell out of fashion. In fact, the oldest known image of a sauropod in paleoart was not even produced in the US but in France, appearing in Nicolas Camille Flammarion's 1886 book The World Before the Creation of Man. Interestingly, the now dubious genus Atlantosaurus is portrayed at least somewhat accurately, being a large, fully terrestrial animal with a long neck, as opposed to the swamp-dwelling depictions that would become commonplace in the following decades. In the accompanying text, Flammarion describes several sauropods in essentially accurate ways, as gigantic long-necked animals with small heads of herbivorous character and as denizens of terra firma. This view would be largely ignored, however. It would take until the 1890s for American paleontologists to realise the power of dinosaurs as educational, promotional and commercial aids for museums and scientific institutions. Under the direction of Henry Fairfield Osborne, the American Museum of Natural History in New York hired artist Charles R. Knight in order to produce paintings for the newly opened Department of Paleontology. The incredible paleoart produced by the prolific Knight would help catapult dinosaurs into mainstream public consciousness, with now iconic depictions of extinct animals appearing by 1897. Museums placed dinosaur fossils front and centre, with the remains of Diplodocus, Triceratops and Brontosaurus towering above visitors, while other artists soon followed suit. Soon, the emerging medium of film would ensure dinosaurs remained a perennial fixture in the public consciousness, in ways unimaginable to Hawkins, Marsh and Cope. In fact, Hawkins died only a few years before Knight's paintings went on display, and I'm sure as a prolific science promoter, he would have greatly appreciated them. Thanks for watching everyone. The next episode will cover the evolutionary history of the terror birds. So until then, I'll see you again soon. Cheerio.